Hello, I'm Glenn Hall, and today is April 15th, 2023. This video is called The Final Three Plagues of the Great Tribulation. I am going to continue reading from a prophetic writing by Leland Earls that he wrote uh, somewhere between 1967 and 1972, so it's at least 50 years old. And we are going to start with the Eighth Plague. I've done two previous videos on this. Uh, I think they're called God's Judgments Are Speeding Up because I believe we are, um, we are right on the verge of the fourth plague. And I covered the fourth plague at the end of the first video, and then the fifth, sixth, and seventh, and the second. Today we start with the eighth plague. These plagues are patterned after the plagues in the book of Exodus that God poured out upon Egypt when Moses confronted Pharaoh to let God's people go. And God is confronting Satan right now so that he will let his people go. The eighth plague. <clears throat> the storm of the seventh plague was followed by further devastation under the Eighth Plague. This was brought about by an invasion of locusts from the east that we see in Exodus chapter 10, verses 4 and 13. Before the plague came, Pharaoh was warned, and at the advice of his servants, he was willing to relent and let the men of Israel go. But Moses insisted that all were to go, including their herds and flocks. Pharaoh then scoffingly refused in Exodus 10, verses 3 through 11. This shows that in the great day of battle, which is coming, Satan will never cease trying to get the Christians to compromise in one way or another. Satanic controlled forces and the dictatorial society of the beast empire will put every conceivable pressure upon Christians who refuse to conform and support their regime. But those who are determined to remain true to me shall gain the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, as we see in Revelation 15, verse 2. I will protect and preserve them in that day, and they shall be completely delivered out of the Egypt of this world and ushered into the kingdom prepared. Remember, the Egypt of this world is called Babylon the Great. And God has put it into the head of the eighth, the eighth head of the beast to destroy Babylon the Great. I believe that Donald Trump is the eighth head of the beast. And what we are witnessing today, all of these catastrophic things that are happening throughout the world, and did you hear just... Uh, a few days ago on Monday of this week, a huge dairy farm in Texas was destroyed that killed over 18,000 head of cattle. That is the largest loss of cattle, I believe, in the history of this country, dwarfing anything that has happened in, um, in our lives. But that's not all. There are catastrophes happening seemingly daily with wrecks of trucks that pour poisonous chemicals all over the land, with train wrecks, with barges breaking loose with hazardous materials. Um, we are seeing, we are seeing the beginning of the Great Tribulation. The great event that happens when we know that the Great Tribulation has begun is the glorification of the 144,000. That's what happens in the fourth plague. Continuing here with the eighth plague. Pharaoh's refusal to let the people go was followed by the greatest invasion of locusts ever experienced in Egypt. In Exodus 10, verses 13 and 15, the whole land was darkened by them, and they completely devastated every green thing. 
Locusts are used symbolically in the scriptures to denote the invasion and destruction by armies. We see that in Joel 1 verses 4 through 7 and also Revelation 9 verse 7. Since it was an east wind which brought the locusts, it would indicate vast hordes from the east marching against the west. If you're watching the news at all, you know about the war between Ukraine and Russia. It's a proxy war. It's really the United States and all the Western nations in Ukraine that are fighting against Russia. And then you also have Russia and China joining forces with respect to a new currency. And so those are nations of the East. And so here Leland Earls is saying, since it was an east wind which brought the locust, it would indicate vast hordes from the east marching against the west. This is simply a further phase of the great storm of conflict depicted under the seventh plague. The nations of the east, under the banner of the hammer and sickle, will move to conquer all who stand in their way of complete world domination. Many nations and areas of the world will be afflicted, affected but the most strategic area as it affects the final phases of world conflict will be the Middle East. This area will be almost completely overrun and the onrushing tide will engulf much of Europe. But the die will not be cast to lethal annihilation through East-West conflict until the Middle East and Palestine are inflamed in war. The symbolic portrayal of these marching hordes from the East is described under the fifth and sixth trumpets of Revelation in Revelation 9, verses 1 through 21. Now let me say something here that will really stand throughout the um, the rest of this document by Leland Earls. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. That means that what we believe, what a prophet believes in his mind, in his soul, with respect to certain things, will affect his prophecies. There are certain things that people believe that are just going to come out because that's a doctrine or a thought, a belief that they sincerely hold. And and so their theology, in a way, will control what the prophetic utterance is in this time period. The scriptures say exactly what God wanted it to say because he spoke directly through those men without error. If you are paying attention It really seems, from what I can see, that the United States and and the Western uh, nations have become just as totalitarian as Russia ever was. And so there's this thought now in this document that is going to be... um, the evil of communism versus Western capitalism or or Western Christian nations. I think the reality is that all of the nations of the earth have conspired against God. All of them are part of the International Space Station, which is a hoax. All of them are part of the chemtrail program that that um, is used to control the weather throughout the, the earth and also is used for the scalar weapons that destroy places like uh, Paradise, City of Paradise or something in California uh, several years ago that cause earthquakes 
catastrophic earthquakes. I think, for example, um, the earthquake in Turkey earlier this year was probably caused by a scalar weapon. And all of the nations are part of the Antarctic Treaty. You wouldn't have chemtrails show up all over the world and all the nations, including Russia, unless everyone was in on it. Because a nation that was truly looking out for the interests of its own people would destroy those airplanes that are dumping metals and chemicals upon their people. Now, of course, that's part of the satanic transhumanist agenda to actually create computer systems within our bodies that then merge us with the machine, which allow Satan to control us, to control our thoughts. So, as I continue reading this, understand that all the nations of the earth, virtually all the nations of the earth, are conspiring against God. They keep God hidden. Hidden. That's the reason why there's the whole globe earth conspiracy, because it hides the firmament and it hides the truth of the flat earth. Because there are things about creation that are clearly seen. And when you understand it, for example, the fixed order of the stars... You can't have the earth spinning on its axis, going around the sun at an astronomical speed, and then the, sun, the whole solar system, as they say, hurtling away from the origin of the Big Bang. There are so many different forces going on in so many different speeds, huge, high speeds, that there's no way that we could see the same constellations day after day, year after year, for thousands of years. The fixed order of the stars remains. And God points that out and says that his covenant will remain with man as long as the fixed order of the stars remains. And that remains as long as this creation remains. And so as I continue reading, Bear these things in mind so, so I won't have to repeat uh, these thoughts again. The result of this plague was an earnest entreaty by Pharaoh to Moses and Aaron, accompanied by a confession of sin and request for forgiveness. In Exodus 10, verses 16 and 17. Although Pharaoh's heart was later hardened again, indicating Satan's continued hold on vast numbers of people, Yet, the symbolic action of his is significant at this point. For it shows that many people of the world, especially in the Western nations, will earnestly seek for divine help as a result of the increasing threat of attack and invasion from the armies of the East. I don't know if that's right. I mean, that could be... Could be uh, true believers in any of the nations of the earth. The result of this earnest entreaty will be a quickening of my spirit to further that revival which will already be sweeping through the world, especially in the nations of the West where Christian influence and training has been more thoroughly ingrained in the mental fabric of the peoples. There will be a turning to the Lord as never before. Now, bear in mind, this revival that is used here, and that's probably Leland Earl's word, because every re revival fails. The whole point is that people begin to earnestly follow the Holy Spirit and pattern their lives after the Holy Spirit. But bear in mind that when this happens, when the Spirit falls like this, it's after the glorification of the 144,000. People will have known that their 
was a glorification, that there was a rapture event, and they were not part of it. And so that's going to be one of the major reasons why people really begin to seek God, because they're finally going to realize, oh man, I should have taken my Christian life a little more seriously. This influence will begin to reach into the higher echelons of leadership and government circles. Many shall begin to break loose from the satanic delusions which have held them. They will see that further compromise with the beast of communism will mean certain suicide. And, and I should say the beast of Nazism as well. This includes our government in the West. For the first time in years... A real desire and will to resist further communist advances will arise in those Western nations which have been the strongholds of Protestant Christianity. By this time, most Catholic countries will have been completely taken over by communist forces. The Vatican hierarchy will have fled to the North American continent. An awakened Christendom in those nations which still have a small measure of freedom will spur those in authority to action. Coupled with this will be an awakening among the Jewish people. Many of them will have turned from their unbelief and accepted Jesus as their Messiah. Revival fires will be burning among them. Along with this religious revival will be the concern of most Jews for the nation of Israel, for Palestine will be threatened with complete desecration by communist hordes. Thus will it be fulfilled according to the type that... Quote, the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. According to Exodus 10, verse 19. The strong west wind is none other than the might of the western nations rising to strike down the communist forces. This will be possible only because of the wisdom and strategy which will be given to those in authority by my specially chosen servants of that day. Were it not for the arm of the Lord arising to help those who will have cried to their God, there would be no hope of turning the tide of communist conquest. But the Lord your God shall battle for his people in that day. The armies of Gog, G-O-G, shall be utterly confounded as described in Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. They shall be driven into a red sea of destruction. For truly I shall be exalted in that day, and all shall know that my mighty arm has worked deliverance for those who look to me. The turning back of the red hordes will be accompanied by the beginnings of a short atomic holocaust as the satanic controlled leaders of the Kremlin try desperately to ward off certain defeat. You know, there's talk... Um, on the internet that atomic bombs don't really exist. I do not know the truth about that. I know that there is news that uh, President Putin of Russia just sent out a fleet of warships in order to test atomic bomb readiness. So we may well be seeing the beginnings of this. Russia, seeing their plans for world domination, frustrated. They will make one last effort to destroy the Western nations by unleashing their atomic arsenal. This will be met by the mounting of the atomic armada of the West. There will be much destruction on both sides. But in my providence, I will see that the Satan-inspired conspiracy of communism is completely crushed. The Ninth Plague as Pharaoh's heart was hardened again, Moses was commanded to stretch his hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. Exodus 10, verses 21 and 22. This darkness was to last for three days. Although there is a measure of chronological sequence in the fulfillment of the ten plagues, there is an overlapping and even a concurrent fulfillment of some of them. It was not feasible to portray such detail in the type. 
Therefore, or in the parabolic pattern that we see in the book of Exodus, therefore do I show by revelation how the plagues dovetail together an end time application. From one perspective, the plagues have their fulfillment in the overall end time period beginning with modern day bloodletting through revolution. So that has happened and ha- years and years ago. From another perspective, the plagues have their fulfillment in the short-term period of intensified world trouble, just preceding and during the period of the Great Tribulation. The last four plagues find their fulfillment during the Tribulation period only. So that is the Great Tribulation that we have not entered yet. Running somewhat concurrently, although not completely. The previous six plagues see a measure of fulfillment before the Great Tribulation, although they also continue into the Tribulation period. In considering the Ninth Plague, therefore, an overlapping and even anti-dating principle must be pointed out. For although the Seventh and Eighth Plagues have been portraying the fury of conflict primarily during the last half of the Tribulation period, even unto its fiery consummation, The ninth plague portrays the darkness of the entire tribulation period. In the type, it is placed at this point because of the intensity of darkness, which will characterize the latter part of the tribulation period. The three days of darkness symbolize the approximate three years of great tribulation, for I appoint a day for a year. The tribulation will actually be nearer three and one-half years, but in much typical drama of scripture, The round number usage prevails when portraying time patterns. Now, note the conditions which prevailed during the time of darkness. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. That's quoting Exodus 10. Verses 22 to 23. The light mentioned was a supernatural light provided for the Israelites only. It was a manifestation of the Shekinah glory of their God. In its anti-typical aspect for the tribulation days, it will be the supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit for those who are indwelt by His power and glory, and also the supernatural manifestation or appearance of the glorified saints to give instruction and help. Thus, those who are mine will not grope in darkness through extreme fear and uncertainty as the people of the world. For I will guide and protect them even during the days of extreme crisis, when the world would be plunged into almost total chaos. Those of the world, on the other hand, typified by the Egyptians, will be filled with terror. They will not know what to do or where to go. Many shall perish by lack of direction. They will be afraid to venture out, but will cower in their houses like frightened animals during the final phase of the East-West conflict. As a result of this plague, Pharaoh again called Moses and offered to let all the people go, if only they would leave their flocks and herds behind. But Moses refused, for he knew that God must not be served half-heartedly, or with reservations, but with the entirety of one's being. This is the symbolic significance of Moses' insistence that the animals be taken along. Moses said, You must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. In Exodus 10.25 As pointed out before, animals are a type of the basic propensities, abilities, and drives of the human nature. All of these must be sacrificed to the Lord your God. They will be submitted to the fire of my purging that they may be sublimated and transmuted and channeled to my glory. The primary sacrificial offering which man rendered to his God from the beginning was the whole burnt offering. Since this offering typified the dedication to do the will of God with the entirety of one's being, the whole animal was burned on the altar. Its perfect fulfillment came when Jesus Christ gave himself in life and in death to do the Father's will as we see in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. And through him it is fulfilled in all others who give themselves as a living sacrifice to their God, as we see in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. But nothing can be held back. Moses said, There shall not be 
even a hoof left behind. For thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. In Exodus 10.26 A hoof is symbolic of the lowest or basest of human traits, and not one can be left in Egypt's land. There can be no concourse with or conformity to that which is of the world. For those who would be used mightily in the tribulation days that are coming, all must be on the altar as a whole burnt offering. And for those who want to be received into the heavenly kingdom of Christ, there can be no holding back. No, not even a hoof. The tenth plague. Pharaoh's heart was again hardened, and he refused to let the people go. He even refused to see Moses anymore and said, For in that day you see my face, you shall die. Moses knew that deliverance was near, and he responded, You have spoken well. I will see your face again no more. That's in Exodus 10, verses 28 and 29. Now the final plague was at hand. Special instructions had to be given to the Israelites. They had been slaves and had not received all that was due them. Now they were to leave with much riches. They were to take whatever the Egyptians would give them for their departure. Especially they were told to take jewels of silver and jewels of gold in Exodus 11 too. Their accumulation of these items for their departure is significant. significant. They portray that which every saint must have who is to be translated out of this world and enter the heavenly kingdom. The foremost of these is gold. Gold is a type of that which is of the spirit, spiritual importations and fruits. Remember my teaching on the church of Laodicea yesterday. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire. Also tried and proven character, that which has come through the fires of refining experiences as pure gold. Silver is a type of the soul and soul qualities, also a type of the redemptive work of Christ. It is through the redemptive power of his cleansing and life that the soul is redeemed and made new with its very fabric woven with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The matter under consideration is not just that of salvation. Salvation or preservation from death is through the shed blood and resurrection life of Jesus Christ. But for those who go on to perfection according to Hebrews 6.1, receiving the gold of his spiritual workings and the silver of his complete redemption, there is to be an out-resurrection from among the dead, according to Philippians 3.11, or a translation while living, according to 1 Corinthians 15.51-54, into the glory of his heavenly kingdom. The saved who fail to make this calling and election according to 2 Peter 1.10, will continue to live on earth, eventually receiving deathless life for their physical bodies. Those having already died will be resurrected back to the earth in deathless physical bodies after the millennial kingdom has been fully established. So, my people, now is the time to let me do a perfecting work within you that you might be adorned with my gold and my silver and that you might be fully ready to be received into the glory awaiting Further instructions were given by Moses to the people concerning that which would be the means of their protection during the final plague. They were to take a lamb for each household and set it apart on the tenth day of the month, the first month of the year, which is Nisan, the month that we are currently in, and we've just gone through Passover and the feasts of unleavened bread. Then on the fourteenth day of the month, Between the two evenings, they were to kill the lamb and sprinkle the blood on the two side posts and upper door posts of their houses. Each family was to eat their lamb, girded and ready to depart. We see this in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. The blood of the lamb on their houses was their protection during the final plague, which was the smiting of all the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. This tenth plague was the consummating judgment and constituted the final wrath of the Almighty upon Egypt and her gods, according to Exodus 12.12. Now look with me, says the Lord, to the fulfillment of these things at the consummation of the age, which is drawing nigh. Surely I will bring an end to an end that which is called civilization in this day, for it is almost completely contrary to my will. 
It is based on the worship of many gods, which are constantly placed ahead of, head of or before me. Even millions of Christians are preoccupied with the gods of material things and pursuits of pleasure. They have little time for serious consideration of my word and my ways. They're caught up in the Babylonish systems which are destructive to real faith and dedication. They lean constantly on the arm of flesh rather than leaning on me, as Jeremiah says in chapter 17, verse 5. They have hewn for themselves cisterns which can hold no water, and they have forsaken the fountains of living water, as Jeremiah says in chapter 2, verse 13. They rely on empty forms and dead works to try to accomplish my purposes. Well, as Jesus said to the church of Laodicea, you say that you are rich, but you don't understand that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. In the religious world, it is either idolatrous organizations which hold my people captive, or idolatrous unbelief clothed in sophistry and worldly wisdom which leads my people astray. In the political world, it is selfish and grasping opportunists who dominate the affairs of most nations, leading them into paths of eventual tyranny. In the commercial world, it is traffic in everything, including the souls of men, as we see in Revelation 18, verses 11 through 13. With very little consideration for the ultimate welfare of human lives. Thus, judgment has already begun to descend, and it will not let up until a mighty cry has arisen, even as in the land of Egypt, as you see in Exodus chapter 12, verse 30. The death angel which, which went over the land of Egypt, slaying the firstborn in every family where the blood was not applied, is a type of the power of destruction which shall be unleashed from the atom, both in its deadly radiation and in its immense force of explosion. I say to you, my people, there are two signs given in my word which are of the utmost importance. When they came to pass, every Christian should have been alerted to the eminence of end-time events. The first was the explosion of the atomic bomb, for in the releasing, of it, of, for in releasing the atom's energy, the very powers of the heaven are shaken, as you read in Luke 21, verse 26. The second was the Jews declaring themselves a reborn nation, for this was the shooting forth of the fig tree, as you read in Luke 21, verses 29 and 30. Even so it is written, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is near at hand. Truly I say to you, this generation shall not pass away until all be fulfilled. That's Luke 21, verses 31 and 32. But my people are woefully uninformed and almost totally asleep and unaware of the significance of the time in which they live. A few here and there are beginning to awake, and they are beginning to sound the midnight cry which shall rouse the sleeping virgins, as you see in Matthew 25, verse 6. It will be the atomic death angel which shall pass over the earth to strike a death blow. All will be affected except those who have the blood of the Passover lamb sprinkled on the doorposts of their hearts. For it will be true again as it was true then. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. According to Exodus 12, verse 13. It is the blood of Jesus Christ applied by faith to the sin-stained soul that washes it clean and preserves it from death. This is the present salvation enjoyed by Christians. Peter speaks of in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 23. But it is that same blood that shall serve as a protecting shelter for even the physical body in the coming day of wrath. This is the meaning of the sprinkling of the blood on the lintel and the two side posts. The lintel was the upper doorpost and stands for the physical, which will receive protection. The two side posts stand for the soul, which receives both cleansing and preservation through the shed blood of Christ. There is a further mystery that I would reveal to you with regard to the soul. So many confuse soul with spirit, yet they are separate and distinct, as you see in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. Both body and soul are subject to death because of sin. Not so with the spirit. It is of the very substance of God who is the father of spirits. 
The spirit within each human has been alienated because of sin and needs to be reconciled. But once reconciled through Jesus Christ, then its garments, soul body and physical body, need to be saved or preserved from death. For when a spirit begotten of the Father is placed within an unborn fetus, its innate powers take of the living substance within the developing organism and form a finely tenuous vehicle called the soul. The soul then becomes the means or medium of expression through the physical. It becomes the seed or essence of what might be termed personality, the mental, emotional nature. Since the soul partakes of and is sustained by the life forces of the physical, it is subject to death as is the physical body. The soul that sins, it shall die. Ezekiel 18 verse 20. Thus both body and soul need to be saved and preserved. Now let us look more closely at the sprinkling of the blood. A door represents an entrance into something, also an exit. We have already seen that the doorway with its upper door post represents the outer or physical garment of the spirit, and the side posts represent the inner or soul garment. A spirit makes an entrance into the physical world through the doorway of the embodiment within a fetus, which is later born into the physical world. A spirit makes an exit from the physical world through the doorway of death. A spirit needs garments or vehicles for its growth in understanding and for its continued progress in the plan and purpose of God. Thus, the death of either physical body or soul is a tragic loss for the spirit. In the type, we have seen how the body of the lamb was sprinkled upon both the upper and side doorpost, showing that the blood, which would later be shed by Jesus Christ, would provide an atonement and release from death for both soul and physical body. Cleansing and release come through the blood of Christ, but the importation of eternal life is through the engrafted seed of the living Christ, according to James 1.21 and 1 Peter 1.23. When a soul is thus generated anew through the incorruptible seed, it becomes a deathless vehicle for the spirit. In event of the death of the physical body, the soul then becomes a functioning vehicle for the spirit in the superterrestrial realms. If the soul has been, not been saved, it eventually perishes even as the physical body. Its life forces gradually abate and it slowly disintegrates. The spirit then ascends and returns to God who gave it. Now, I think this is one of the places where he's speaking according to his doctrine rather than direct revelation. Because the lake of fire is where the soul goes in order to be corrected. You see that in the book of Revelation. The second death that's what the second death is all about. The reason why the soul has to go through a second death is because it never learned to die to its own aspirations in this life. And so you see God's judgment in the book of Revelation where the souls of those who fail to repent and fail to lay down their lives for Christ are thrown into the lake of fire. That's going to be the salvation of that soul. And there's many other scriptures that speak of the salvation of all, of all beings. And I, I believe that's talking about all souls. So bear that in mind here. There is so much, my people, that I would like to reveal to you, but I perceive that you are able to receive only a little at a time. The concepts taught by the churches are so completely contrary to my word that I must teach you anew. This is the day that I am restoring to my people the truths that have been almost completely obscured by the traditions of men. Therefore, continue to keep your heart open for more of the revelation of my spirit. To reveal all the details of the Passover ordinances would require a complete study in itself and is beyond the scope of this particular prophetic word. 
It is sufficient now to show you the cleansing and preserving power of the shed blood of the Passover lamb. For in the coming days, when the full force of the judgmental plagues descends upon the earth, only the applied blood will avail for protection and deliverance. Since the final plague is the atomic death angel which shall pass over the earth, it has a measure of fulfillment during the time of the tribulation. But its more complete fulfillment will be during the final days of wrath when all-out atomic war will destroy multitudes. It corresponds in the prophetic picture to the seven vials of wrath portrayed in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verses 1 to 21. Although in type, the children of Israel were not fully liberated until the last plague was set in motion, there is a veiled mystery which needs to be lifted in order to see the complete picture. It has already been shown you in measure. You will note that it was at midnight that the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, and there was a great cry in Egypt, according to Exodus 12, verses 29 and 30. This corresponds to the midnight hour mentioned in the parable of the wise and foolish virgins in Matthew 25, 6. There are different ways in which I am able to smite the earth. The final smiting will be the atomic holocaust. But the actual beginning of the smiting will be my strange work of shocking the church world with the calling out of the wise virgins at the midnight hour. There is a veiled double meaning to the smiting of the firstborn. In a spiritual sense, the firstborn are those who will enter first into the heavenly kingdom as firstfruits unto their God, as you see in Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5. These are the wise virgins who will be received by the bridegroom at the beginning of the tribulation. The result will be the smiting of the careless church world as a thief who breaks into the household, according to Luke 12, 39, to take away the jewels. Also look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 17. A great cry will go up from the nominal church world as the shock of what has happened begins to fully register. Thus, the beginning of the deliverance of those who are fully mined from the Egypt of this world takes place at the beginning of the tribulation period. The foolish virgins plus the tribulation saints will be taken at the close of the tribulation, just as the final vials of wrath are ready to fall. Therefore, there is a time pattern which is somewhat veiled in the type. The fact that Pharaoh was willing to let the people go shows that Satan's power will beg to in to be broken when the first fruits are glorified. I'm sorry, it there was a typo there. The fact that Pharaoh was willing to let the people go shows that Satan's power will begin to be broken when the first fruits are glorified. This is also shown by the fact that when the man child of Revelation twelve is caught up unto God and to his throne, Satan is cast out of his heaven and into the earth. But because he knows his time is short, he comes down with great wrath and causes great havoc before his power is completely broken. The havoc is portrayed in the plagues that came upon Egypt when Pharaoh repeatedly hardened his heart. The hardening is seen in the great wrath which Satan has when he is cast down to the earth in Revelation 12, verse 12. Yet at the same time that he is hardening his heart, his power is gradually being broken. The final hardening. And now consider the final factor in the prophetic picture of the ten plagues. Pharaoh's heart was hardened once more to pursue the fleeing Israelites as they left Egypt. He put forth one last effort to reestablish his former power. This will be manifested at the close of the tribulation as Satan causes the leaders of the Kremlin to launch their all-out atomic attack on the West. Since men on earth cannot pursue after those who will have been glorified and taken into the heavenlies, the object of Satan's final wrath through his human puppets will be the Western Christian nations which will have been instrumental in turning back the communist bid for world domination. Thus the term Israelites in its last day spiritual application has a twofold meaning. First, there will be those saints who are taken and fully delivered from the Egypt of this world. These will cross over the Red Sea and of the heavenly realm and kingdom, being completely out of the reach of Satan's final onslaught at the very close of the tribulation. Secondly, there will be those Christian nations of the West which will largely turn to the Lord, 
receiving deliverance through the blood covenant, but being the object of Satan's final pursuit of terror. Even as with the Israelites at the Red Sea, only a miraculous and providential turn of events will enable the nations of the West to escape without being totally annihilated. But at the crucial moment, the Red Sea of communist atomic attack will be thwarted, and the satanic-inspired hosts of the communist world will be buried in the very atomic holocaust which they will have begun. This does not mean that the Western nations will escape all destruction. Far from it. Yet in comparison to what would have happened had not the Almighty intervened, it will be regarded as a great deliverance. Thus you can see that the episode of the Israelites being delivered at the Red Sea and the destruction of the Egyptians is simply the amplification and extension of the typical truth of the tenth plague. It is one prophetic picture of the final wrath of God implemented through man on all who are to be swept away as so much refuse in preparation for the new millennial kingdom. In that hour only my power shall be able to deliver, even as it was spoken by Moses. Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord shall fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14. For I will separate in that day those that put their trust in me. The angel of my presence shall stand between them and those who are to be destroyed, as you see in Exodus 14, verses 19 and 20. He shall be a protecting covering over the blood redeemed, but he shall be as the darkness of chaos and doom to those who submit not to my righteousness. The flood tide of battle shall overwhelm them and they shall perish from the earth. After the crossing of the Red Sea and the deliverance from the Egyptians, the Israelites sang a song to the Lord. It is recorded in Exodus chapter 15. And Revelation chapter 15 is a picture of the redeemed and glorified saints also singing. It says, And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, you King of saints. Revelation 15, verse 3. Yes, my people, many shall see my great and marvelous works in this last day. For mighty shall be my power in the midst of those who are fully mine, and mighty shall be my power in the overthrow of the forces of wickedness. But more important than this, the inhabitants of the earth shall begin to learn my ways, which are true and just. And in time... The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of my glory. So shall saints in glory reign in righteousness over a cleansed and fully redeemed earth. End of Prophecy by J. Leland Earls. I'll put the link to this prophecy. I encourage you to read it again. The time is at hand.